Okay, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome back to the symposium. Um, <clears throat> thank everybody for sticking with us after lunch. And for those of you out of the time zone, I hope that was um, an adequate break for you all as well. Um, I'm going to pass things over to my colleague at Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Ms. Allison Colden. Thank you, Tanner. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the afternoon session of the Chesapeake Oyster Science Symposium. I hope you all had uh, a great break. This afternoon, it's my pleasure to move us into a panel on oyster ecosystem services and how to leverage those to increase the scale and pace of oyster recovery in the Chesapeake Bay. We've got a great panel for you, and you've already heard a little bit this morning about ecosystem services, and you may be wondering why ecosystem services matter and what they are. So oyster ecosystem services refers to a broad suite of goods and services provided by oysters and oyster reefs. Um, traditionally, we think of things like water filtration, uh, nitrogen removal, habitat provision, and several others. Uh, as we heard this morning, oyster reef restoration in particular can be expensive. And in the Chesapeake Bay region, it's been funded in large part by uh, public dollars. So there is a level of practicality in terms of quantifying and understanding the oyster ecosystem services that come along with restoration, um, because we're responsible to uh, the taxpayers whose dollars have gone into those restoration projects. But in addition to that, uh, understanding ecosystem services also helps tell the story of both aquaculture and restoration. And so understanding what uh, people value, especially in areas where restoration has occurred and harvest is no longer an option, understanding the other types of benefits and values that restoration can offer in those situations can help bring in new constituencies and also help build broad public support for restoration and aquaculture practices. So with that, um, I would like to kick off this afternoon's panel. Our first speaker today is Lisa Kellogg. She's a senior research scientist at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and she'll be sharing with us some aquaculture water quality re research. So take it away, Lisa. Um, hold on. Okay, there we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So what I'll be talking to you today is about the continuum of ecosystem services from restored oyster reefs to floating oyster aquaculture. But before I do that, I wanna put um, what we're talking about today in the context of the Society for Ecological Restoration's restorative continuum. And so when you look at this continuum and you're moving from left to right on the continuum, it's expected that the quality and quantity of ecosystem services increases from left to right. And at the left hand side uh, lies primarily the reducing impacts and improving ecosystem management lies primarily in the realm of watershed and fisheries management actions, which isn't really what we're focusing on today. And then at the far right hand side is fully recovering native ecosystems and that's decidedly unlikely in Chesapeake Bay. We've got 18 million people living in the watershed. We've lost species, we've added non-native species. And on top of that, oyster lifespans are now about uh, less than half what they once were. So where we're really focusing today, I think is um, when we're talking about oyster reef related ecosystem services is in this central section talking about repairing ecosystem function, initiating native recovery and partially recovering native ecosystems. So when we think about ecosystem services, we generally think of them as scaling with oyster abundance or biomass, things like water quality improvements, habitat for other organisms, shoreline protection. We all think those are gonna improve as oyster biomass improves. But we also recognize that some of those functions may sort of level off at some point in time, or there might even be a peak where there's an optimum level of biomass to achieve the greatest um, benefit per unit oyster biomass. So for the rest of this talk, what I, when I talk about a restored reef, what I really mean is an area where restoration activities have occurred and that those activities um, were primarily focused on small unconsolidated substrate like oyster shell, or small granite, something along those lines, and, and or where juvenile oysters have been planted, and all of this is in direct contact with the substratum. 
So this graph is one that I put together that basically shows um, the range of oyster biomass that we think once occurred on reefs uh, based on some work by Lockwood and Mann. And then below that, I've put the oyster reef restoration metrics in orange. Um, so those are really just a starting point for oyster biomass when we're thinking about restoration. The, um, the graph below that is the Maryland Restored Reefs. That's from the NOAA 2020 Monitoring Report for Maryland. That's the range of observed biomass. And then below that, I've put four different types of oyster aquaculture um, based either on studies we've done or reported harvests from Virginia. And what you see is that um, oyster aquaculture biomass can fall right, right in the same range of biomass and sometimes even exceed that for restored reefs. When we think about uh, ecosystem services, we think a lot about filtration, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that filtration uh, is actually enhanced by other organisms that live on oyster reefs that are also filter feeders, and their biomass can sometimes exceed that of, of the oysters themselves. Oyster aquaculture also provides habitat for other filter feeders, but in most cases, they're generally considered nuisance species and, and are cleaned off or um, they, they're fouling organisms that, that people try to avoid having on their gear. And finally, it's worth keeping in mind that refiltration can occur at high oyster biomass densities, meaning that the organisms upstream from an individual oyster may have already cleared the water. And so since filtration is the precursor to denitrification, which is um, a way that nitrogen, the oyster biodeposits that sink to the bottom are, are um, broken down by microbes and the nitrogen is actually released back to the atmosphere, it's not surprising to see that denitrification as a function of oyster biomass increases up to a particular level of, of oyster tissue biomass that's somewhere around 250 grams um, dry weight per meter square, but then tapers off a bit after that. And that's likely due to the refiltration I mentioned earlier. Interestingly, if we take a look at uh, the one site for which we have uh, denitrification measurements for an intertidal extensive aquaculture site, those numbers fall right within the range of numbers that we see for subtidal restored oyster reefs in Chesapeake Bay for denitrification. So there's the potential that, that extensive aquaculture sites may provide some of similar ecosystem services to restored oyster reefs prior to harvest. That's probably not true for intensive aquaculture, at least within the footprint of the farm. And I'm sure that Jeff Cornwell will be telling you more about that a little later today. Intensive oyster aquaculture is very different from both extensive aquaculture and restored reefs. It can be done anywhere in the water column. They use a wide variety of gear types. The spacing can vary widely. It's a novel artificial habitat. And there's a very wide array of farm practices and those practices um, can change frequently. Uh, so, um, so it's very difficult to extrapolate results from one aquaculture farm to another. Engineered structures used for reef restoration are also very different from both extensive aquaculture and restored reefs. Again, there's a wide variety of designs, a wide variety of spacing, it's a novel artificial habitat. And again, it's very difficult to extrapolate results from one type of engineered structure to another. Also, in some cases, priorities other than enhancing oyster populations are the primary goal. So the take home message I would like to leave you with today is that reef type and aquaculture type alter oyster ecosystem services. And in the absence of data, you should assume that ecosystem services of intensive aquaculture are not the same as those from restored reefs. The same is true that engineered reef structures are not equivalent to restored reefs. In some cases, extensive aquaculture prior to harvest may be similar to restored reefs. And finally, the threshold and target oyster biomass densities are just the starting point for restoration. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. That was a great introduction to uh, oyster ecosystem services, both in restoration and aquaculture.
We're going to move on to our next speaker, but before I do, I just want to remind everyone that if you have questions for any of our speakers as they're giving their presentations, please feel free to put those in the Q&A function and they can answer them live or we will answer them during the Q&A at the end of today's session. So our next speaker up is Scott Kanaki. He is the director of the Morgan State University Patuxent Environmental and Aquatic Research Lab, uh, also known as the Pearl Lab. And he'll be chatting with us about some of the economic impacts of oyster reefs. Okay, let me unmute um, and let me put this in uh, presentation mode here. Um, all right. So um, I don't hear any shots from Allison, so I guess you can hear me and you can see my, my slides. So I'll, I'll get things moving here. Scott, um, we do and, not see your slides. You don't. Please make sure you're hitting the green share screen button at the bottom. Yeah, I, I, there's an icon that says stop sharing right now. That is, I'll try, I'll click the stop sharing button because I'm sharing. And I'll try to share again then. Well, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> share again. <clears throat> there we go. And now just there we put it go. into slideshow and we'll be good to go. All right. I still get seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Allison. All right. And glad to be here today. And I'm going to be talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the economic impacts of oyster reefs in particular through the lens of restoration activities and commercial fisheries. I'm gonna lean on some previous research that I've done with a colleague, uh, Tom Eide, also at the Morgan State Pearl Lab, a number of other contributors uh, to this project, but, but Tom was a, was a gigantic part and really a driving force of this, of this effort here. Um, okay, so before we get into uh, the restoration activities and the um, potential benefits to fisheries. So what is a regional economic analysis? And it, we see the figures in the media, uh, you know, a billion dollar economic impact for this industry or some other economic impact for this university. So you see a lot of the figures in the news media and other places, but what is it? So, you know, really the motivating question is, you know, what is the effect of an economic event broadly conceived on a regional economy? Um, and the regional economic impact analysis attempts to discern that effect of an economic event on a regional economy. Uh, so this takes a variety of forms. Uh, think about recreational, fish, recreational fishing in the coastal U.S. Recent NOAA study estimating $10.5 billion in annual economic impact from those fishing trips. What about aquaculture in Maryland? Well, um, actually a recent study by CBF uh, estimated that aquaculture operations uh, in Maryland contribute an average of $9 million a year to the state's economy. And, it, and as I mentioned, even universities too, what's the economic impact of a university? And where I'm at, Morgan State University, a recent study showed that that impact tops $1 billion. So, so what does that all mean? And, and typically in these economic impact studies, there's a, um, the counterfactual, right? So there is an amount of impact generated. And then if that event did not occur, there would be no impact. So, so the counterfactual is typically zero. Within the, con within the context of marine recreational fishing trips, that $10.5 billion is compared to if there were no trips, which would of course be a total disaster and something has gone very, very wrong uh, because you wouldn't go from that, from you know, millions of trips a year to no trips, right? But that is the inherent comparison. The same thing with the Morgan State, uh, the state budget versus a zeroed out budget or an aquaculture industry in Maryland versus no aquaculture, which is perhaps actually the most relevant salient because there actually was a time in a fairly recent past where there was no aquaculture in Maryland. So that actually, that comparison is, that packs a, a little bit more punch, if you will. What a regional economic impact analysis does is it tracks the flow of dollars between different industry sectors. And it, this is important so within a study area, okay? So there's direct effects and that's initial pulse of spending 
and those generate additional buying in other industries, local industries, um, and those indirect effects generate induced effects, which is the respending of labor income. And it's important to note that both direct effects and indirect effects generate induced effects. And it's the summation of these three that give you that total economic impact figure that you so often see promoted by folks that want to talk up the importance of whatever it is that they're, that they're doing. And with our case, it's oyster reef restoration, right? So um, I'll spin through this quickly because I'm already kind of losing a little bit of time here. Um, we know, I think a lot of folks know the restoration that's gone on in Maryland, three tributaries. There's another two coming that are just getting started. Uh, but this is what our analysis looked at is this three tributaries in Maryland, Harris Creek, Tread Avon, and a little chop tank. And as Allison said, it costs a lot of money to do this, and we need to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. So this is the first step. It's like, well, what did that $52 million that was spent between 2012 and 2016, it also does not include private expenditures and some other expenditures, but that $52 million in federal investments in this restoration, what did it generate in the region on the Eastern shore that is adjacent to the water bodies where the restoration is occurring? And the initial expenditure was 53 million. And then the when you add that, that's the direct effect to the indirect effect and the induced effect, you get a total economic impact over five years of $123 million. But really the most interesting thing, in my opinion, is not how you can spend money to get economic impacts. That money can be spent anywhere, in any place, on anything, and generate economic impacts. So what's really fascinating, in my opinion, is, well, what about how the oyster reef situation, the environment, the amount of oysters changes? And how does that change an industry and perhaps benefit that industry, just the existence of this new habitat, right? See, this is a conceptual framework for the, for the model. It starts with an ecological food web model called EcoPath that estimates a harvest in an oyster reef, you then filter it through an economic impact model, and it gives you jobs and sales. And we'll focus on sales in the next slide here, um, or next couple of slides after this. But this is the model of a food web. It's a complicated mess of lines. But what you do here, is, and this is a model of the, the young restored reef food web. What you do is you um, modify or adjust that the ones in that circle or that oval right there, and that changes the amount of oysters. And you can, mo you can model what happens if there's no oysters or, or redu reduced state oysters? And what happens if there's more oysters, right? If it's a mature reef. <clears throat> so I just got a couple more slides here and then I'll wrap up. First, I'll look at the harvest impacts of blue crab. Young restored reefs produce in the Chop Tank River system are projected to, to produce about 3 million pounds of blue crab. The counterfactual, <clears throat> if restoration did not occur, only 2.1 million pounds will be produced. You're getting an additional 900,000 pounds of blue crab in the young restored reef scenario. However, if that was allowed to mature, then you get 5.3 million pounds of blue crab. Just as an FYI, the blue crab was really benefited highly from this restoration where some other finfish species, not as much. And blue crab is highly valuable. So uh, wrapping it up here quickly, um, the policy scenarios in blue crab and the annual economic impacts <clears throat> and the current stage, $11.6 million in total economic impacts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, and then the counterfactual, if you did not do that restoration, you'd get about $8 million. So you're getting about $3.5 million more in regional economic impacts or comparing the counterfactual to the of no reef to the future state of mature reefs, up to 12 to $13 million additional regional economic impacts. And that's a summation of the indirect, direct, and induced. I sense I'm probably running short on time. This slide just kind of you know, gives you some of the, the summary um, and I'll just kind of stop it there just to preserve time for other folks, yeah. Thank you All very right. much.
Well, thank you, Scott. Um, there we go. Uh, we can just leave this up for just a second as we transition. Uh, appreciate that. So uh, hopefully everybody's got a chance to take a look at this slide. Um, mm -hmm. Very interesting economic impacts there, especially for the blue crab fishery, which in Maryland is another very important and very valuable fishery for us. So um, next we will be transitioning to our third speaker, Dr. Matt Gray, Assistant Professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Okay, uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, I assume you see that right? Yes. Okay, all right, great. Okay, well, Allison, thank you for that introduction. Um, I am happy to be here today to talk to you about our Living Breakwaters Project and Coastal Defense in Chesapeake Bay. So uh, I have an example of hybrid infrastructure in which uh, we've integrated oysters to a drowned jetty at Horn Point Laboratory to um, revive it and prolong its uh, effectiveness. Uh oh, okay, I, I detected a glitch, but I think we're still going. Um, so, and what I hope to do in this presentation is, um, I wanna suggest that we can both restore oyster reefs as well as, as well as leverage them to provide added coastal defense. So um, uh, I need to start by saying that I'll be talking about this research topic, but it's being investigated by all the people mentioned here, which is a diverse crowd, it includes biogeochemists, um, a geomorphologists, uh, uh, res resilience program managers, uh, and uh, other modelers. So uh, starting from a very wide picture, we need to acknowledge that coastal flooding due to extreme weather and sea level rise is of growing concern at a global scale. Anticipating these threats, um, increasing coastal resilience, which I've defined as the ability of a system to return itself back to its pre-impact condition is a top priority among many coastal countries. And lack of resilience is expensive. Um, and annual rep repair costs are mounting um, due to continuous development in coastal margins, as well as greater storm severity and frequency. Communities around the Chesapeake Bay are not immune to such impacts. For example, in Maryland, um, we experienced some of the fastest rates of sea level rise in the country. Um, and as a result, nuisance flooding is on the rise, pun intended, in, in Maryland. Uh, and the impact of storm activity will be exacerbated by sea level rise, creating greater flooding and overwash events. So the need for coastal protection against such event, events is vitally important, particularly to these coastal communities. So we have lots of great infrastructures such as riprap and breakwaters, jetties, et cetera. Um, the, these are common features in the Chesapeake Bay and they're vitally important to protect coastal communities. But the condition of this infrastructure varies widely throughout the Bay. Um, breakwaters are of particular concern as they are, they are likely the most vulnerable form of infrastructure uh, to sea level rise. Uh, and many of these structures will drown in the coming decades, becoming less effective over time. We already see uh, plenty of signs of failed infrastructure around the Bay. So just using uh, Google Earth last week, I took a trip around the Bay and uh, it was easy to find plenty of examples of drowned infrastructure in the Chesapeake Bay, which is no longer effective. Um, much of this infrastructure is quickly accompanied by um, uh, large amounts of coastal erosion, which uh, if not replaced or repaired um, uh, by new infrastructure, if, it, if it's not replaced, you know, we get this erosion. So uh, the question is, what do we do with failing infrastructure or what do we do with the non-failing infrastructure when we are anticipating the, these approaching threats? Um, so one thing that uh, there's a there's a growing uh, impetus for and greater interest in is if we can green the gray infrastructure, um, can we give it resilience uh, and the ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions? 
can we both take a novel approach to restoring oyster reefs while prolonging the effectiveness of gray coastal infrastructure? But before we get to that question, we also need to ask, why would we wanna do this? Well, oyster reefs have many attractive traits from both an engineering and ecological perspective. First, they are well-recognized to stabilize shorelines and have played uh, a very important role historically in dampening uh, storm swell. Oyster reefs can grow and accrete at similar rates to sea level rise, meaning that they can provide lasting perfection, uh, protection over long periods of time. And importantly, these structures, unlike gray infrastructure, can repair themselves. So if they're damaged by um, ice flows or storms, they can uh, build themselves back up again without any human intervention. Uh, so they can also adapt to environmental cha change um, or changing environmental conditions. And a really important thing that um, kind of follows along the lines of what uh, Scott was just men mentioning is that the habitat created by oyster reefs is far greater than traditional infrastructure and supports a suite of ecologically and commercially valuable species. So our approach to integrating oysters with gray infrastructure starts by modeling how breakwaters themselves alter the transport of wave energy and sediments. So I can play you uh, a model simulation. Well, there it goes, okay. Um, so this is a model simulation, it's, it is running. Um, and what it does is it, it uh, uh, oops, you know what, I'm, I'm on the wrong slide. Here we go, we're gonna do that again, okay. So uh, this is a model simulation, uh, which shows how the shoreline evolves due to um, the breakwater that is that yellow bar out in front. The model accounts for physical, the physical environment as well as changes in sea level rise to estimate how a given breakwater may dampen incoming waves and prevent erosion over time. So the model output, which is shown on the right side of your screen, indicates that uh, the breakwater deposits sediment on the backside and stabilizes the shoreline. So next we add our oysters to this uh, simulation you can see how I've depicted it with this little uh, cartoonish oyster, but in fact, what we're using are oyster castles in our field studies, as well as our model simulation. And um, I don't need to get into oyster castles. We've seen them earlier in the day, but I will just mention they are, in cinder, they are interlocking cinder blocks that you can put spat on top of and essentially build a reef rapidly. So what we estimate is that by adding oyster castles to breakwaters, it increases deposition and enhances the effectiveness of breakwaters over time. Uh, oh, so I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna run through this. Uh, we've been conducting uh, a bunch of research with, on oyster castles. So uh, we're, we're becoming very familiar with uh, how to uh, deploy them um, uh, in field studies. We're about to resume these studies this summer after being on a hiatus due to COVID. Uh, and we've also been recently funded to uh, explore designs on how to optimize oyster castle integration with uh, existing infrastructure. Uh, I think I'm going to follow in the shoes of Scott and I'm going to leave the summary slide for you guys to read. Um, uh, maybe take a screenshot, but thank you. All right, Matt, thank you so much. Um, you know, shoreline armoring and the hardening of shorelines in the Chesapeake is not unique to the Chesapeake Bay. That's a problem that is uh, experienced uh, all around the coasts of the US. And so figuring out a way to retrofit and work with what we already have, I think is a very interesting approach. Um, and considering how much shoreline armoring there is out there, that could be a tremendous opportunity to leverage that for oyster recovery. So great work there. And we look forward to seeing more as the project continues to develop. All right, so lastly, we will move into our last speaker of today's session. We have Dr. Jeff Cornwell, research professor, uh, University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And he is going to be wrapping up by telling us what we do know and what we don't know uh, about nitrogen removal on oyster reefs. So take it away, Jeff. Okay, Allison, do you see that slide? Yes, Very I do. Good. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a bit about looking forward from where we are with our understanding of uh, nutrient ecosystem services in, in Chesapeake Bay, uh, aquaculture and restoration environments. The, um, so 
there's several steps to go into thinking about this. Step one is, is where a lot of the scientists and where we are, we're observation, we're developing observations of enhanced denitrification and nutrient removal associated with aquaculture and restoration. Um, hopefully, you know, there's some commonality between lots of sites and they're not all, you don't need all site specific rates. However, um, we're, we're, we're developing an understanding of many different uh, places and, and, and situations in terms of nutrient removal. But there are a couple other important steps beyond um, a lot what I'm uh, mostly what I'm talking about now. And then as science and the policy, development of a BMP. A BMP is, is the entry into crediting um, nutrient removal in sort of the Bay model context and, and in a, uh, um, a management context. And that's an ongoing process. Implementation, if you have a BMP, implementing it means that how do you develop accrediting for it? And that really is done by Maryland and Virginia, the state governments develop the protocols and policies for crediting and with approval from the Bay program. And the final step is if you have crediting, um, basic, pretty much local governments can include this in watershed implementation plans for crediting. And I think there's a lot of interest nationally as well as in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in terms of marketing for these kinds of credits. So what do we know? We know we have a current BMP for nitrogen and phosphorus removal with aquaculture harvest. Basically the tissue, not the shell, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus can be uh, uh, calculated from harvest and, and uh, uh, be put into a credit. We know that denitrification is enhanced in restoration. Uh, Lisa talked about this and that BMP is soon to be evaluated by a broader group. Uh, we know that a substantial proportion of denitrification is associated with the oyster shell biofilm and associated organisms, not just with the sediments associated with these, these uh, facilities and restoration sites. And one thing that's very clear is um, there's a huge interest nationally in oyster-related nutrient credits. Um, there are presentations a lot, I think, in Massachusetts, and, and in New England in particular, there seems to be a lot of activity in this. Um, I'm not as sure where they are in terms of um, um, the policy aspect of it, but certainly there's data being developed in those places. So I'm gonna go through it, just some really quick uh, highlights and what we know, recent observations. So in Harris Creek, biomass is the key. Lisa showed another plot of this, but you go from sediment to low, medium and high biomass, which I won't define for you now, and you look at the removal of nitrogen via denitrification, and it goes up. Um, we also know, again, that if you look at a regression of oysters or oysters plus sediment versus uh, oyster biomass, essentially, you see an awful lot of uh, the denitrification is not on the bottom, just staying with the sediment. We also have uh, a developing uh, a data set in terms of engineered surfaces. So if we look at a comparison here, and these are uh, on, on a daily basis, you worry about the, the scaling between these, but sediment does uh, a little bit in shallow. Harris Creek is a big jump up at, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, the denitrification on a daily basis. Reef balls, which we've looked at here in the Chop Tank River in a couple different positions and, and off of Tillman Island, um, do a lot of denitrification. And um, the more oysters, it seems to do more. And the cove that, that Matt was talking about with oysters and no oysters, in some cases, we're getting extremely high rates. And with this oyster veneer, basically what he was talking about, putting um, oysters on, on existing structures, um, we got a sort of a world champion rate for an, one observation and something we need to follow up on. We also know that we'd like to have correlates. So in the middle panel, you know, the amount of oxygen taken up is going to be related to how much nitrogen is remineralized and how much denitrification occurs. And here we have under dark and light conditions in the summer at Harris Creek. If we go to the panel on the left, um, here we looked at the chlorophyll A removal rate versus removal uh, of oxygen and um, the production of dinitrogen and ammonium. And that aligns our data very nicely as well. So this makes sense. You take material out of the system and you, um, you alter it into denitrification. 
And there are things we can do like the efficiency of denitrification relative to stoichiometrically how much nitrogen is remineralized that might be helpful. Models and mass balances can be used. This is uh, Jeremy Testa's uh, paper. And if you look at the amount of biodeposit production versus how much is processed underneath, this is a, a, a site in, from the Chop Take Oyster Company, we see that most of this has moved away. So the footprint doesn't look particularly good, but if you denitrify this further away, that's a help. What more do we need to know? Um, Lisa talked about this, is on bottom aquaculture equipment to oyster restoration. We have variable results from publications outside the Chesapeake. We have a little bit of data in the Nanticoke River from Melanie Jackson's thesis that shows a, a big spring jump up um, in terms of denitrification. Number two, are some structures useful for nitrogen removal and via denitrification? Early results look promising. How much of this you put out is going to make a difference. For water column aquaculture, can filtration, biodeposit production, and biodeposit export result in enhanced denitrification? We need more information to really take this further. What are the challenges? Sufficient data to include on bottom aquaculture and planning enhanced wild catch, the shell committees that, that put out uh, uh, SPAN on shell. With sediment cores alone, are we fully assessing water column? caged aquaculture benefits, cost-efficient tools to make site-specific measurements, and can we add other ecosystem and societal benefits to our understanding, shoreline protection, enhanced economic activity, improved water quality. Um, the final point I want to make is that this whole field, there are probably four or five laboratories nationally that are looking at these kinds of uh, measurements. So for students thinking of thesis projects in, in terms of nutrient removal by oyster communities, we're not very far along in the develop, development of our understanding of the value of aquaculture and culture of other bivalves. So we're in this first wave of science and it's fun because everything we touch is, is relatively new. However, really moving forward, new ideas and approaches from young scientists are really going to be needed. You know, you can't have a small subset of scientists um, developing all the information. We need new ideas um, and new people. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, for all of you young career scientists out there, you heard the call. Uh, we need you. And there's still plenty more work to do on oyster ecosystem services. We're just getting started here. So Thank you, Jeff, for that presentation. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're going to move into the question and answer portion of today's panel. Uh, again, if you have questions for our panelists, either specific questions for one panelist related to their presentation or more general topics, please feel free to put them in the Q&A function. But I'll go ahead and kick off with a couple of questions that were um, put in here while we were doing some presentations. So the first one is for you, Scott. Uh, from Doug Myers uh, asking, given federal dollars are often matched with state or local cash and in-kind services, are those dollars included in your analysis? No, those dollars are not included in this analysis. It's strictly federal funds, federal expenditures. Um, so uh, the expenditures on oyster reef construction, material transport and oyster seeding were, you know, large, Many of those were our federal expenditures, and all those federal expenditures were included in the in the economic impact analysis. Um, and also, you know, staff may have been or were likely relocated and reallocated federal staff to work on this coming into the region from other regions. That was also not considered in this, or we, we can really not get at that. Frankly, it would have been very challenging. Um, and then just kind of lastly on this point, uh, the economic multiplier, which accounts for the, that respending, the spending and respending uh, for Talbot and Dorchester counties for the, the restoration activities was 2.32. So that means that for each, each dollar that was spent, an additional dollar and 32 cents circulated throughout the Talbot and Dorchester economy before leaving that region. So if one were so inclined, one could imply, apply that, uh, that economic multiplier to try to get at what might be those economic impacts, more broadly speaking, from other expenditures in the area. Yeah. Great. Well, Scott, while, you've got, while we've got you off mute, um, I'll shoot another quick one your way. 
Um, Matt already answered this in the context of oyster castles, um, but this mm -hmm. is a question from Bay McLaughlin. How long does it take to be considered a mature reef? So in your modeling exercise, uh, what mm -hmm. was the age to be considered mature versus early restoration? Yeah, we didn't use an age in this model. We used a density, right? So it was um, achieving that target of 50 oysters per square meter over 30% of the area. And that was a mature reef. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Scott. Um, I want to go to a couple, one more question that we have. And I think anyone can sort of chime in on this one. This uh, question is from David Pazzillo. Since the University of Maryland is developing underwater drones for monitoring oyster populations for aquaculture, do you see an application for this technology in the conservation realm? And anyone who wants to weigh in on that, just go ahead and unmute. I can start on that, and I think uh, several other folks can can add more than than than, than I possibly can. But uh, in terms of ecosystem services, uh, we are hanging our hat on oyster biomass in many cases, and um, in, uh, in, in restoration, there's often an uneven distribution of biomass. And so having an understanding of that would be a, a benefit in terms of, uh, of determining on, a, say, a, a hectare basis, um, what kind of numbers we should assign in terms of, uh, of um, nitrogen removal. So I can also weigh in on that. Um, I'm a part of that project, um, which is funded by the USDA, but we're also intending to leverage that uh, drone to help. Um, we'd like it to be used as a survey tool. And, um, you know, it's, its primary intended use was to help growers survey their lease and do inventory. But we also think that it could be useful uh, for monitoring restoration success um, and doing a lot, covering large areas and helping to monitor um, it, how th those efforts have been successful or not, which I know is a big challenge, which has already been discussed today. Yep. Anyone else on that one? All righty. Um, well, there was another question uh, from Amy Yarnall, uh, which uh, was in the questions. I think it was great. And Matt, you had a great um, response to this, but I'm hoping that you could just sort of quickly summarize for everybody else uh, on the webinar. So Amy says, I've seen other breakwater experiments, not with oyster castles, that sediments accumulate behind the breakwaters, but then can sometimes be scoured out from the shoreline adjacent to the edges of the breakwater. Um, have you seen that in any of your experiments or is the sediment accumulation extended past the shoreline directly behind the breakwater? Yeah, so we, we've built several long um, structures in our cove. Um, and what we see is that there's a lot of deposition directly behind the breakwater, but at the edges, they, they're on some of them, there is scouring and actually that breakwater is starting to um, be undercut and, and uh, subside. Um, so that presents, you know, um, an engineering problem for us, like, oh, we should maybe think about how we orient this different designs. So that's one thing. Another thing, too, is that what we're finding, or at least the model suggests, is that although it um, sediments may uh, accumulate behind the breakwater, they actually may be, in some scenarios, robbing uh, uh, the, the wetland in the background on the shore of those sediments. So um, in some scenarios, they may be preventing um, those sediments from reaching uh, and re-nourishing those, those wetlands, um, which is an interesting paradox to tackle. Yeah, that, that is interesting uh, dynamics there. Um, Lisa, I had a question for you, uh, sort of tying together Jeff's previous comment about how a lot of these ecosystem services quantifications are based on biomass. Um, you showed in your presentation sort of the different levels of biomass under different restoration and aquaculture scenarios. And one of the things that you mentioned was that the oyster success metrics for restoration are really kind of far down uh, on, the, on the lower side of that scale. So I'm sort of curious, do you think that the metrics that are currently being used are, should just be sort of an interim step? Should there be another higher 
uh, goal um, for restoration in the future, considering that we've been able to achieve higher densities and biomasses and some of these other uh, restoration and aquaculture scenarios? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the you know the 50 grams dry weight per meter square is is a good starting target, but as the graphs that I put up there show, that's that's not achieving full ecosystem services. I mean, the hope is that that's enough to to jumpstart um, reef restoration. But you know, my primary concern in some ways is if you're talking about trying to produce more oyster larvae by having oysters have to be really, really close together for larvae to, um, to for them to fertilize for the eggs and sperm to come together and, and produce larvae. And so the closer you can pack those oysters together, there's a really much higher likelihood. There's almost a step function in the fertilization success, depending on the concentration of sperm and eggs. And it actually takes if I remember correctly, it's somewhere on the order of a hundred to a thousand sperm per egg um, to get successful fertilization under something resembling field conditions. So really stepping up and making those biomass densities much higher could jumpstart the population by increasing larval production significantly. Yeah, that's great. I think one of the one of the biggest questions. Um, you know, around oyster restoration is this idea of larval spillover from sanctuary areas, sanctuary reefs into harvested areas. And I think what you've presented here in terms of that, um, you know, density and biomass being a starting point to try and kickstart the population to continue to grow that biomass till we get to a point where uh, maybe there is enough happening and the hydrodynamics situation is right to to actually start seeing that in a way. Um, and then you also have the challenges of being able to track where larvae come from, which is another, which is another huge challenge. I think everyone on this panel probably recognizes with respect to um, larval spillover as an ecosystem service of restoration and aquaculture for that matter in diploid situations. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch on, I got a question, another question here for you, Scott. Um, you mentioned the uh, 2.3 economic multiplier uh, for mature reefs in the chop tank region, and that blue crabs were sort of the, the test case. Um, do you recall, were there any other species that were positively um, affected by reef restoration and um, you know, was there an associated economic benefit with that or was it not enough to be quantified? Yeah, um, white perch were a uh, significant beneficiary and it was like large proportionally, but because of the modest harvest in the Chop Tank River, I mean, there is some for sure and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but the modest harvest and the, the relatively lower, low, um, you know, dollar amount that you'd sell it for at the dock is just really you know, several hundred thousand dollars, but we're not talking about on the order of like millions of dollars, which is the potential of these reefs to generate for, a, you know, increasing blue crab harvest. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, that's an interesting, Thing to think about because the production itself is the ecosystem service, but its value in terms of the economics depends on other things like market factors and the, the value of the product uh, relative to um, other products. So white perch, yes, it's being enhanced, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's just not as valuable or a product or as large a fishery as blue crabs. So um, that's an interesting thing to think about where the production for itself may be enhanced. So interesting yep. in the context of thinking about enhancement of maybe non-fishery species mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. whether that is also considered an ecosystem service. Um, so yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, maybe another point. Um, so, so the approach we take, the ecological model, EcoPath um, produces a harvest estimate we take a relatively simple approach to estimate those direct effects, the sales, the dockside sales values, multiplying that harvest in pounds by a mean um, 
steal a reported price for the species. Uh, so, so yeah, and white perch being perch being small, it was surprising that striped bass. Frankly, um, it was surprising that there was very little effect on striped bass. And you know, you, you saw the food web, you saw the horendogram. These are really complicated models, and sometimes it's hard to disentangle. Like the you know the suspicion from the ecological modeler Tom Eide is that mud crabs are a primary uh, prey species of blue crabs. Uh, and that was kind of driving some of the, the, blue, the large blue crab increases. Uh, yeah. And then finally, like recreational fishing would be something great to look at in the future. Uh, it's, it would be trickier to do because you, you, you don't, you're not selling the fish you catch, the striped bass or whatever it is at the dock, like you are in the commercial fishery. But if you're changing trips, like the, both the location and then the number of trips, there could be some very large recreational fishing related economic impacts that it would, it would be more complicated to explore, but very interesting and probably needed at some point too. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, I think we have time for two more quick questions. So I'll throw one to Matt and one to Jeff so you guys know who's on deck. Um, Matt, in terms of sea level rise, one thing I'm curious about is if you think that that will positively impact habitat availability for oysters in the Chesapeake Bay, either by increasing the volume of habitat or by changing the like salinity patterns, for example, if we see more saline water coming up, this particularly in the Maryland portion of the bay. Yeah, so I don't think the answer is very uh, straightforward. Um, I'm like most things in this world, it's complex. So um, more saltwater intrusion into the bay should increase the habitat um, northward in the bay, but then um, that may give uh, more potential to um, dermo MSX to migrate northwards. Uh, uh, additionally, any saltwater intrusion may be pushed back by the anticipated um, increase in uh, precipitation that we're expecting with with uh, atmospheric temperatures increasing. So um, how that will actually all play out um, and what that means in terms of oyster habitat, um, changes in oyster habitat availability, stuff like that, that, that I have not seen a real comprehensive study that integrates all those complicated factors over space and time. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question um, and that seems really, uh, a great opportunity for someone that is really has some very sharp modeling skills um, or an interdisciplinary study. I would like to see that myself. Yeah, great. Again, another uh, another star in the notes for uh, graduate students or prospective students. Um, and last question for you, Jeff. Um, I was really interested, obviously, uh, in some of those engineered structures and the denitrification rates on those. Uh, and, the, and the oyster veneer. So I'm curious if you think that those high rates that were observed there are related to the high levels of biomass on a per unit area, or do you think that there's anything inherently about the structures itself that would influence the, the chemistry? Well, we see, we see a strong relationship to filtering. So I think it's probably related to the, the number of oysters that are there, but we also, of course, we see a lot of filtration uh, by bryozoans and, and, and barnacles as well. Um, I think it's the, the probably mostly the high biomass. Um, and, and it may be partly that, you know, that when you get high biomass, there's potential to retain more of the biodeposits within the structure that you have with these animals. And because um, if you have a clean sweep, I think Lisa has evidence that, you know, some of these intertidal sites don't denitrify as efficiently because the biodeposits just, they don't have a residence time there. Um, but, um, and it surprised us with this one veneer. Again, it's, it looks like a world champion block of oysters. Uh, whether we can replicate that over the long haul, we'll, we'll know more by the end of the summer. Great. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists for their presentations and for their um, interesting insights during our Q&A today. I think We've come a long way in terms of understanding oyster ecosystem services in the context of restoration and aquaculture, but today's discussion shows us we still have more work to do, as always, um, and also how important these things can be to try and leverage um, increasing efforts as we move forward in trying to restore oysters. So um, 
thank you all. And I will turn it back over to Tanner now. Thank you, Allison. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, fantastic conversation. And I love the uh, like all the things that we don't know and that we do need. Um, so I hope that people listen to that. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a five minute break. and We'll gather back around at two o'clock. Thank you all very much. <laughs>